of M4 is shortly this. It's a story of church planting in Norway since 95, beginning of 90. We start a national network for church planting. And uh, during 20 years, we have seen like 400 new churches planted in the nation from all different parts of the church body. And in the end of, the, uh, of 2000, around 2009-10, we start to ask the question, how can we train church planters and their team, the grassroots people, uh, to plant churches more effective? That was the question we had. And it's also out of the, the understanding that we believe everybody can be a part of planting a church. But not everybody is the church planter. And that's the important distinction. Uh, and then we came together from different denominations, a day of praying and listening to God, uh, from the Pentecost, from the Adventist, from the Lutheran, <laughs> from the free, from the state church of Norway, Lutheran state church. And we, we really asked God, God, what do you have for us? What, what, what are you answer to the question? And all of that day of prayer, M4 was birthed. And I think that has been within the 20 years we have national kind of gatherings where we gather church planting leaders since the beginning of 19. And every time we have had ongoing prayer as a part of or gathering for church planters because we really believe that church planting is hard work and prayer is an important thing <laughs> when you work with church planting. So out of that gathering we start to form uh, some training materials that we tried out in Norway and then we start in Latvia and Latvia was also kind of a trying out place <laughs> and and the, the all big question, how can we make a training that is not only for the church planter, but for the whole team? Like for seven, eight people who really work to plant the church. So that was the main, how can we, can we do a training that is not only the church planter, but a team around the church planter, like more grassroots? And how can we make a church planting training that is multipliable? That is, that we can give away into denomination, into organization, or into other nation. That was our main question. And out of that was M4 birth. And it's not Lutheran, it's not Pentecost, it's a mix because it's not a model, it's principle. And it's, it's birth in an environment of churches and denomination that see the kingdom of God is more than themselves. And I believe that's the truth. <laughs> the kingdom of God is more than the Lutheran church. If someone say amen. <laughs> so that's the environment that, is, that was birthed in. And it was an Adventist who came up with this because since the, if church planting is for everybody, then there is something that is for everybody, that's the Great Commission. And therefore, it's about the master, the four, first M, master. I'm giving all authority in heaven and earth. He is the master, he is the church plant, he is the one who calls, he is the one who sends. Everything starts with the gospel, and then with the gospel, everything starts with Jesus. And then with Jesus, every, it's about his kingdom, his church, he's the center of everything, he's the king, he's the one who calls, he's the one who sends, he's the one who initiates. It has to start there. And that's the Great Commission starts. So that's the first M was the master, his, and then his mission. Go therefore. There will be no church without mission engaging into the society. And then, do disciples, multipl multiply. And if you don't multiply from the smallest unit, you will not have a church plant. 
<laughs> Multiply disciple from the smallest unit is the most important when we really win mission, engage in society, engage winning people for Christ and multiply from the smallest unit. Discipleship. And then I'm with you all the day, movement. Because God has a greater story to tell. He is on the move. And we need in Europe to find a way of how we can multiply church more than only add church. And that's a big question, and we have not the answer, and hope the answer will probably within the next 10 years in Europe start to be visible. How can we see more movements of church planting? And the whole, the, this, this nice figure here, when we started in Latvia, one of the church planters was Christianis, who's leading uh, Ascetic, who's the one, one number one graphic design bureau. <laughs> and he said, what you do is quite poor. Can I make the graphic for you? <laughs> well, do it. And he made the whole graphic for him for, for free. And I can't do this. I have no clue. So I'm not a very uh, gifted guy in many ways. But, but this is um, what it became. It's the 4M. It's four topic, four areas that is drawn from the experience of church planting in Norway. And then we form, what some of you have seen, like four modules that could be eight modules, it's very flexible, about topics that we think from the practice of church planting in Norway the 20 last year with interdenominational that we think was important for working with planting new churches. And it's these books that have been written is in English now. It was in English last. It's, it's very, it's, it's from, it's Pentecostal, it's Lutheran, it's Adventist, it's, it's written from people from all denominations. And then it, it, it's more principle based than a clear theology on baptism. Because maybe I would have a little different view than some of those. So it's, 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 it's birth out of this environment. Um, and it's like four topic of each master mission multiplication movement that is formed. But to that, we have put some learning goals in each, I will show you. And that's maybe the most important of it. What are we really want to see with each topic? Um, and then, what is the M4 training process? Because that's, what is the difference? What are this, because, and I don't believe that what we do is the final thing. I don't believe that what we have start to do is the thing. I believe that we have been obedient to what we have been given and we try to facilitate and, and, and take responsibility as good as we can. But I don't believe that this is it. I really don't believe. <laughs> I believe, I believe it's a lot of improvement that is possible. I believe that the topic is maybe have to be changed. I believe it's flexible. So I don't want to sell you one method though, <laughs> not at all. And I think the people we, we work in Sweden or Estonia or Latvia, they will know that we are not trying to sell them anything. And to be honest, we are trying to give our life to them because we are serving together. And now we are serving together across nations through the network. So what is the training process? Well, the vision is to ignite multiplying church planting movements all over Europe. And that's big. But then everybody can be a part of it. That's a vision that is much bigger than M4. So um, I often say that M4 is a tool for the first phase of church planting. 
And for his research tool for everyone with an interest in church planning is a design as a process helping to explore the important issue that may be present from the moment you start carrying the dream of a new fellowship until the dream has come true. It's a process for the church planning team for the first two, three years of the church plant. Because that's a danger phase. <laughs> so it's a guided process for the first two, three years of the phase of the church plant. Um, and designed. It's, it's, I think, you know, in, in America we have le learned from them that church plan is A, B, C. And A is the assessment, B is the basic training or booth camp, and C is the coaching. Uh, we're going to have with Steve here uh, on the church planning track assessment training. In the church planning track here now we have, we have divided into uh, a church planning network, four groups. Didre Schindler, who does movement, and then we have a foundational with Richard is leading. Then me and Steve going to have assessment, how do we assess church planter. And then we have uh, coaching for church planting. So we have four groups of 50 people, around 50 people in the church planning network. Because we think all of these are important things. But the M4, in some way, is the boot camp, is the training of the church planter. But the training can be taken away from the coaching. <laughs> so training and coaching is really the heart of what we do. And we create a learning environment for CP team in the process of planning a new fellowship at church. It's teaching, teamwork, time for prayer and worship. And we have four gatherings now. We have done this in some nations uh, of 30 hours within a period of one and a half, two years. That's not much. <laughs> but that's, that's how it's designed at this point. So, for example, uh, in Czech, we know I was in, I was in Czech in... I was, well, I was in Czech now uh, in the last week of April, where we finalized the first process with 18 church planting team, 100, 10, 100 plus people. Uh, and, and that was like the pilots we did in Czech. I think what is, we have made a small video also for Czech, like to see, to feel, because it's better that you see something than I talk. Because then you have a more feeling of what it is. We stole. I'm stealing a lot. Some of us, and my friends in Norway, was a part of something called European Church Planting Network, ECPN. I don't know if you know about that. But uh, it's the leadership network who did something in Europe. And what I did had a special learning pedagogy. It's Tom, Tom McKee who trained the people in the leadership network in that pedagogy. And we use that in the learning community. So it's not a content driven, it's a process driven. The team who's gathering is working with their own process. But we give input on topic that we think is important. And when we give input, we have some question. And the question is yourself. This God is working in yourself. The question is, who am I and who do I, uh, who, what do I want? Because when the team is sitting there around, it's a question of also each individual. Who am I in this? What do I want? What have God spoken to me? And when we give in inputs, they have to ask the question, who am I in this? What has God spoken to me? But then they have to join together and say, who are you? and talk to each other in the team. And what have God spoken to you? And out of that conversation, you go to the next question. Who are we? And what are we going to do? And what is, needs to be done? And then the third, fourth question is, what is God doing around here? Because he's maybe doing more than we see. And how can we act and interact in what God is doing? So behind the gathering, there's some key question. There's some uh, pedagogic model. Therefore, the gathering itself, we can change to reach the purpose of the gathering. Depends on what people are there. 
but we have a model for the gathering. But like in Norway now, we are changing a little bit because the question, do we really reach what we want? So we need to adapt, but the principle under the gathering is the same. And it's, it's to create, in some way, a kingdom, a kingdom understanding, it's spiritual for us. And we have been every places like five to six, seven people from Norway coming into the training, all church planter, practitioner. To pray, we have not always there to teach, we are there to pray to listen to God, to interact, to pray for the people. Because it's a lot of spiritual prayer and discernment. And it's highly relational. And to see in Norway, we have 30 teams now in training. And to see teams from the Pentecost, Lutheran Free Church, Lutheran Organization, the Free Church, the Baptists, in one room, listening to each other, building relationship, appreciating each other, different models, challenge each other with the models. It's amazing to see what God do, do through that. Because it's relational. In prayer, but it's also operational. Because when you discern, when you relate, there's something out of it. It's operational. We're going to do something. It's not like we have got knowledge, the question when you go out together is, what do you do the next half year? And all the team will go out with a clear action plan. So this is how it's done like now, in a program of 30 hours, just practically. We come together, every team present, we have groups of six teams, present where they are. We do a SWOT, we are presenting SWOT. Then the team leader stands where the team are and people can go and ask questions. Why do you do this? What have you learned from this? Where are you now? So they can learn and ask questions to each other. You have an interactive learning. Then we have a break and then we have a, a topic. But when we have done a topic, we challenge the team to go together. They are in the group, and then they ask the question, what is God speaking to me? Who am I? And what is God speaking to you? Who are you? But out of that, they go together. What is God speaking to us that is important for us to act on? And they put on the learning goals for the team. And that means very different, because the context, the model, where the people are is very different. You understand that? So it's very different, but they have to take it into where they are and what they need to do. And we do that with all, with, with a different topic. And the different topic have, each different topic have some learning goals. Like when we talk about the church planter, we want to understand, they have a clear understanding of calling, sending, and the importance of being a comfortable relationship as the team and church planter. Not alone. Understand the importance of clarifying one's commitment to the core team, both in terms of length of time and in function. Because there is so much unclarity sometimes. Are you committed together? For how long? In money? And what are you... So we challenge them on all the hard questions. And I really think that's important. Understand the importance of the scope of the ministry that uh, in the uh, God gives in the church planter. Because we believe in that there has to be a church planter and the various model of church planting. What are you planting? We have to get to see. Is the goal or is the process? And after each, in the end of each gathering, they have a two, three hour to work on their action plan. What are you going to do next, six months? What are the important? Because also church planters get distracted, they think they should be a part of everything when they should concentrate and do what they should do. And I say to the church, you know, forget prayer meeting in the city, forget everything else. Be on your, <laughs> be focused. If you're not a focus, you will not get the church out of God. Be focused. And I think it's so important. 
So we challenge them into an action plan. What are they going to do? And then when I work on the action plan, they present, like we have groups of 16, the action plan. What are they going to do to the next time? To each other. And we pray for each other too. Listen to God. And they make notes of things they get from God and put it on the, the flip charts where they have the action plan and encourage each other. Because it's spiritual, it's relational, and it's operational. And it's all things together. We will say you can't go in M4 because before you there is a church planter, a leader, and a team of at, at least four people around him. That's because that's the criteria to start the M4 person. And that you have a clear vision of planting a church. So that's before, that's the pre-work. Yeah, yeah, that's a pre-work. It's not like coming in and see if you're going to plant a church. No, it's a pre-work and I think assessment. Therefore, we know implement assessment. Yeah. And, and we work with that. So you have a good pre-work before you're coming in to the M4 and start a trade. The thing now is that we have had a 20 years. You know, Norway is small. It's like a city. It's small. It's small, it's small, it's small. So in some way, maybe it's not accurate for Europe. Uh, but, but we have had... A, a, a 20 years ongoing national process. We had a con we had a new we had a we had a, what do you call a, not Congress a, a conference in March now with 800 leaders and church planters and uh, with with 40% uh, under the age of 35 and 15 organization denomination stood together with one purpose, how can we plant churches and win people for Christ in the nation? And we, we made a, I think that's on the website, we made an agreement together as the body of Christ. You can, I think you can see it here. Uh, it's on the home, first page. Here, here you have all these, all the denominations. So we made an agreement. Oh, sorry. That's from the conference. Sorry. We, had, we made a repentance and we were 800 people signing that document of we will share the good news of salvation of people and plan new churches in place with little or no active Christian witness. Between 2015 and 2025, we will work towards planting 400 new fellowship and churches in Norway. And we will equip 4,000 pioneers and church planters. And we will work for a renewed trust in the Bible as the word of God. Our obedience to the Word of God will be the foundation of our being disciples of Jesus and the church being salt and light in society. So we were 800 people from 15 denominations, all top, top leaders, committed together to do this for the next 10 years. And it's, it's quite amazing to see that unity and what, how God is doing through that. You, you know what, what is important here is simplicity. Because I have... Omega manual developed by the Federation Church Plan in East Europe, like a lot of things, but where you have everything in one, but I don't think that's always the best. Uh, I think you need to, this is cut through helping the church planting, the team from where they are to where they want to be within the three year, and help them by this process and coaching in a healthy process and keep them accountable to keep the focus and do the stuff. So these sessions that you described are like mm -hmm. two coaching sessions, not together. It's not coaching session, it's giving inputs yeah. and have them to reflect on lesson learned from church planting the last 20 years that we think is important. So the question is, well discipleship. What happened in your church when a new convert come and you bring it into discipleship? What do you do? We don't say, we could say, go and learn from Potterbrook, go and learn from there. The Baptists have something, the, the, the Lutheran have something. But we will say, what do you do? It's your responsibility as a team to think through what you do. But we don't tell them, this is the only way to do it. <laughs> we give them the question and the principle, what we have experienced that is important. And then we help them. And in the group, there is some, we know these resources. We don't need, we say, well, 
Find the resources. Find your way. But we don't, if you should put every resources into one materials, then we can gather everything we have. So it's very focused. And, and there is, so this coaching, I said that, we have some, but it's, and that's another thing. <laughs> and sorry for giving too much maybe, but we develop an online resource. We developed something called uh, a grow daily. <laughs> it's, it's grow daily. It's Twitter and all this stuff. <laughs> so this is grow daily is an online learning tool that is being much more again than we thought of. <laughs> so we have now three thousand people in there, and the Pentecostal church in Sweden is using that to train local leader on every level in the whole Pentecostal church. Of how many churches of the Pentecostal church? Yeah. Four or five hundred? Eight hundred churches. They have made a decentralized training that I use the Grodley. Because the Grodley now is developed, and we are not finished with this. <laughs> but it, but it's, it's developed on Moodly, and I can go in I go in here, so I just do it like this, broadly, I log in, as I in, here, and then I go to the different classrooms, and then you see I have, I just check Estonia, I maybe take this learning, in learning, English learning classroom, and then here is all the resources, here's the videos, here's the team assignment, here's everything. And this is a tool that you can, because it's Moodle, it's an online, it's an open source. You have it in every European language. And it's, it's quite nice. So what we are aiming for, because everything is, is like here, is, I'm teaching on the kingdom. Um, you can listen. So, so we have this. online to where all the teaching are. So what we are aiming for is what we call flip the classroom. Mr. Master. This is this Latvian guy who do this. I don't know this. <laughs> I have no clue about this. <laughs> I like him. He's brilliant. So on this broadly, all the teaching, we have also si assignments because there is something we think every team has to do, like clarify the vision, but like uh, clarify commitment in the team. So we have some that every team has to do and put up the report of how they did it online. That's visible for the coaches. So it's keep them going with high accountability. And one of the things we think is where we aim at is that um, so this is on the road layer. Uh, and it's easy what, what we do like in Czech now or like you are starting to do it. In Sweden they can listen a little to Norwegian or the English because we have all the teaching in Norwegian and English. But then now they start to do this film their own teaching in Swedish language. And then it's totally Swedish. <laughs> and then in Czech, they will start when they have done a process or two, then do all the teaching in Czech language, and then suddenly everything is in Czech. It's brilliant. Then you multiply it into their own culture. And the language on the, there is, you can change it, and you have it in language, their own language. Um, so that makes it easier. And you can, and that's what, what the new generation are doing. And that's where the whole school system is going. It's flip the classroom. The content you can get outside the classroom. The process you do inside the classroom, the reflection. And that's where we want to go, like in the direction we want. We have gone there already. But it's, you can, they can look at the content and they can put reflection on the content online that's visible for everybody. And then we come together and we have less content 
more reflection and learning. Yeah. It allows also that, like we do know, in probably we'll do when we start the next big round in Norway, we can have a central gathering in the first module with 20 teams. But because of travel, we take the decentralized get next gathering with like five, eight, and seven teams. Decentralized. Because it's there. It's all, it, everything is available. So you can, you can be flexible in the system and how you do it. Because you can. And one of the denominations who do this at all put in some of their theology also. <laughs> and they have like a video of how we think in our organization in there. And that's, I say, well, fine, do it. It's totally OK. What we want to see is that we keep focus on planting churches, winning people, planting churches. And you do it your way. Bless you. So this is, um, this is M4. So you have elements of the gatherings, the learning communities, of coaching, and of an online platform that's strengthening their accountability and also give it, give it more flexibility. And I think, again, I don't think all of four teaching is the revelation of everything. And for me, if you teach about vision in my way, his way, or your way, for me, it doesn't matter. But if the church matter, don't know where they're going, they are in trouble. <laughs> so, so it's more the principle and the key question and learning goals that's behind, that's important. More than if you're teaching this way or this way. If you teach about team, building the health of team, my way, your way, or your way, well, maybe we're teaching a little different. But the question is, how can we help this to build this healthy team that really can take in new people, disciple new people, we know, that's the question. I maybe could say something. M4 is about taking teams, not one, but the whole team, where you have one church founder and at least four in the team, from where they are to where they want to be, within a span of, I would say, two to three years. In the first phase, that is quite critical in church planting. And we use a learning community, coaching, and this broadly online platform to strengthen the process and to keep account the, the process really accountable accountability in the process. I to be honest, I, in the Norwegian process in Oslo, we get in two teams that are after the first round kicked out. It was too premature. That was too early. It was, they couldn't go the process because they haven't clarified something first. Therefore, we see the, even more the necessity because the denomination meant that it was clear. And I had to talk to the leader and be honest with them. I said, well, are you sure they are clear and clear, uh, ready to do? No, well, we tried. We are trying to have like, we, since we have it in English and, and Norwegian, we can have like these immigrant churches. So we try in Oslo area where there's now 100 immigrant churches in Oslo area. And then many of these is, has different kinds of leadership, say that way. And they are connected to like the Pentecost or the Baptist or different. And they see they need it to get into a framework where they connect with other Norwegian teams to really, yeah, to work out what they are doing. So we try, but that's not easy. But we want to be there, to have different cultures. So it's to take where they are, to where they want to be, use learning community, coaching, and an online platform. What we have done, in, like in Czech, we met with the team leaders and the coaches eight months before. And we did some training. But you have to take what you have. <laughs> when there's lack of experience, you have to kind of start with what, what's there. Like you were with Cesar with, in Latvia. Yeah. And Cesar was training 
Peter, Kaspars, Igors, uh, some of them coming here from Latvia, and and was brilliant. So so someone other trained the coaches that scored in just and it's good for me. It's the kingdom. <laughs> I'm very relaxed. But you have to secure a quality in the coach. Uh, but at the same time, you have to start with what there are. We, we work, I have also on the Grodley, we now have coaching training if you want, we, we can put out, we, but, but again, like in your, you have, you have the knowledge. <laughs> uh, so, but the, the coach need to have the knowledge of what M4 are. So we put them on the Grodley to see through the teaching and give them the book to read through so they understand the process of what they're going to go through. Because then they don't start to take up the question that they know well, let them be a little bit less. It's coming. <laughs> so so we, we, we have a gathering with the team leaders before they start and also clarify how the team in place. And we have a gathering with the coaches. In Norway, we have done trade coaching training. I have some, pen, like Eystein Jarna, he's a Pentecostal, he will be here and be a part of the coaching track. He's brilliant in coaching training. He's the best I know in Scandinavia. So, so we have some coaching training. We also talk about if, you, if I'm, as a Lutheran, coaching a Baptist church, what are my role and responsibility and what are not my role and responsibility? To clarify, the coach role is important when you do it cross-denominational, it's very important. Uh, understanding your authority, what have, have you on and what should you not. So when theology issue coming up, you don't deal with it. You say, well, you have an overseer, go and talk with them. So you, we talk about clarifying roles so you, you not mess it up, especially when we do it cross-denominational coaching. Yeah? Catholics? Uh, that's well, 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 good question. Thank you. Uh, I haven't been so much involved in the Catholic Church because Norway is a more Protestantic nation, and most of the nation working with it is not so much Catholic yet. <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> no, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm working with, with Marc and Fluence uh, in France, who's leading the global Alpha course for Catholic Church. They are Jesus believing, evangelical, spiritual within the Catholic Church, who leading the global Alpha. And to hear the story of what God is doing within that context is blowing a lot of this Protestant environment, what we are experiencing, like, wow. And there is, there is, the picture is bigger than we often see. That's a part of this. But I'm, <laughs> I'm a Lutheran pastor. <laughs> so we do some coaching training, yes. But when we start M4 and we help, because it's relational. We have been in check with team of 7 to 10 from Norway every time. We are paying our bills, we're taking people in mission, and we give ourselves to people. It's relational. We are not selling. We, are, we give everything for free. It's no, we're not earning any. We don't try to build a brand or anything. To be honest, we want to see the kingdom. So it's relational. What we did, I connect with Yiri Ungo, who's here. He's the leader of EA in Czech. And uh, we got a relation. We prayed together. And uh, then he asked me to come to check and in a, in, on an innovation thing. And I talked to 20 church planters. And we connect relational. And then we ask God if we're going to do something together. And then they thought it was the right timing to do something. And then uh, I took with me someone from Norway and I get, I said, well, find something to do it together with. And then he collect Daniel Huchta and Daniel Klebeck and Tomashi and a group of five, six people who all are recognized in their own denomination, in the nation. Because Yiri 
as a leader of EA, he, ha he is recognized himself. He, everybody trusts him. He's also the board leader of EA in Europe. So, so, so then he, and we get down some, and we had two days praying together, <laughs> working together, seeing how we could do that. And then we said, well, what you need to do is gathering some coaches who could coach these people. And then you need to find a team who are in the CB church that could be this first team. Who have you in uh, the Salvation Army? Who are the Baptists that could be this? Who are the Lutheran? Because the Lutheran have two teams in there, from the Lutheran church in the south of Czech. Uh, no, it's in border here in Ostrava. And, and then they start to work to identify. And then we said, well, gather these people. We come down. And we had a group of four or five people. Uh, also then from Latvia, because they have done it in Latvia. So we took some from team from Latvia down. And we shared the story. We trained the coaches. And we clarified with the team leaders what they're going to do and how they need to gather the teams and so on. And that was half a year before we started. And then we put them on the on this platform, and then they start, have then already started to translate everything into Czech. So here now, here now, if you see uh, what well, is here, wait a minute. And this has happened uh, quite fast, web shop. I'm not selling anything because this is not, because no, the book in English, you can go on Amazon, but we have printed version of PDF in English, here is Czech, Czech language, Estonian language, Swedish language, Latvian language. So the books are in Swedish, Latvian, Czech. The books here? I have two books there. Okay, no, no, no. No? I haven't. I haven't print, I have no printed books. It's, it's on PDF. It's on PDF. You can download it or you can buy it on Amazon. I don't want to have any in store, and I don't want to earn anything on it. Get it out. <laughs> Get it out. <laughs> they, it's, so it, it's, it's, it's in Spanish now, the first book. <laughs> so so they, they start to translate. But to be honest, the Czech book was finished when he finished the first round. But we just translate some materials like to get it out. And, start to do it. But then we gather with the coaches and the team leaders, and then we started. And then suddenly it was 18 teams, 110 people. And if we would do it again, we would have 8 to 10 teams. I will say of these 18 teams, 10 to 12 is really healthy and will grow. 6 is more or less, I'm not sure. But that's the reality. Well, the last, the last two years we've done that, one and a half year, okay. two years. How often do you go back to that? Every six months and something in between to serve them. Yep. Yeah. This, this four modules, Master, Mission, Guest, Movement, six months between. We did a little faster, but it's not, you have to have six months because you don't really get to work on this work if it's two. So, so we did it, we came down with the team of eight, 10 Norwegian, and now we have some Estonian. And so what we do now is that we create a learning environment for church planting. So in September, we meet with teams, our team from Norway, working with them for, from Sweden, from Estonia, from Latvia, and from Czech, 50, 60 people, two days, facilitated by a guy called Tom McGee from US, plus the American. There are a lot of good things to give. And uh, to really understand how can we improve everything? How can we work to get things better? Because there's a lot, a lot of improvement. But again, it's a process, and it's relational, it's kingdom-minded, and we don't know what will happen. We, we really don't know. We, ha we couldn't predict two years ago what we're doing today. Uh, and, yeah.
So, so, um, so it's a translation. But I hope, and also as we said, what I say to them, if you start in a nation, cross-denominational, or within one big denomination, because you can start within one big denomination. But we see it's good often to have, often it could be a big denomination who includes some others who are connected with them. Uh, but we want them to say, what I say to them, you can start it. Within three to five years, you totally contextualize it. Every thesis should be in your own language. If you want to rewrite some of the book that kind of fits your, the, the, like especially the team assignment and so on, well, do it. Please, it has to be in your language. We think some of the lesson there could you, it's better to listen to because it's lesson over the 20, 30 years of history of church planting or practitioner. That's why we have the stuff there. So it's good to listen to it, but it's absolutely, make it your own. And let us keep a relational. So we meet once a year, two days, in a learning environment where your learning from Czech is brought into the other nations because we need to learn from each other. So that's, and then I say to them, within three to five years, you have to give and serve another nation or denomination. Because then we multiply. So that has been the, the issue. So now the, the Latvian, no start M4 training in Ireland among the 90,000 Latvian living in Ireland. 90,000 Latvian living in Ireland. And there's a lot of Christian, but there's no clue about community and church. So they started M4 training with teams from different cities now in Ireland to help the Latvians in Ireland to really build healthy community and new churches in the nation. So, well, and I, I, don't, I don't go there. They go there. They are multiplying. So, and the Estonian, Teo, who's in Estonia, will probably start in Romania within next year. They are now, the, both books are translated to Romania. And I haven't done anything. They are doing it. I, here you have to be cultural wise because it depends on how the climate of unity are in the nation. You have to be wise. Some place is better to do it in one denomination. Uh, so it depends on the climate. In Norway, because of 30 years, and because we are a little village, everybody knows each other. Anyhow, if you don't, if you want or not, uh, it's so. So I think it's wise to understand. You have to adapt to the culture and the environment. What's there? It's, you can't copy because the history in Norway is different than the history of Hungary when it comes to unity and work together. And, and, uh, and what, from my perspective is that there can be a pride in this. Uh, I see that some of the best church plans we have in Norway are some of the Lutheran state church who have planted churches. And the Pentecostal need to see that to reduce their pride of thinking they have everything and they know everything. <laughs> so by bringing them together, you in some way help them to see that the kingdom and what God is doing is even maybe more effective and they doing very well there. But we are just seeing our thing. So it, to help people to broaden the picture. And it's also for me, when I'm working national, is to, in all nations, you have some of these more apostolic leaders. We have someone who's planted now five churches within some years, there are a thousand people in Norway. And, and, and young people look to them. No matter, you, young people from the Lutheran church, look to them. Young people from the free church, look to them. Because young people like people who succeed. Okay, I know people. So what I want to do is to, I need these people in the room because they are raising, maybe this is not Lutheran to say, but they are raising the faith level. 
they are giving picture of what could be to people in another denomination that create hope for the Lutheran, hope for the Methodist, hope for the Baptist, who maybe don't do that. So because when you put them in the room in M4 or in what we call a forum for church planning that we have yearly in Norway, you create, you, you uh, leverage the learnings in the rooms and you create an atmosphere of faith that is possible even though in a denomination who feel they don't succeed and especially with young people you create hope therefore for me it's important to bring these together in a nation because I'm thinking how can we see the whole nation <laughs> and then we need all organizations, all denominations and when it comes to the liberal, they don't plant churches any, anyway. They will not be in that environment. Because we are only talking about winning people for Christ, sharing the gospel of Jesus, lead people to Christ and plant new churches. So they will not be there. And our network, we are part of the Lausanne movement, where we have this, we are a network under the umbrella of EA in Norway. So the dawn what we call, not the dawn, but the National Church Planning Network is a part of the EA. So it's on that foundation. Yeah, evangelical life. Going, uh, we are not compromising with our own belief, that we are secure enough in our own belief that we can embrace others and, and challenge each other what we do. And I think that, that's really good. And I think that unity is best in mission. When you have unity, not for the sake of unity only, but we are united in a mission, there's power, there's really power. And that's what I see in the nation. When we are united with a clear mission, we're going to plant 400 churches. We're going to meet in next January, 8 to 10 from each denomination. Maybe 7 to, to 20 denominations because the vineyard wasn't a part of it, the Adventists wasn't a part of it, uh, and two, three others, the network wasn't a part of it when we had the conference. So they will jo join in. And then we meet maybe 80, 180 to 200 leaders from 20 denomination organizations in one room for 24 hours with the question how can we help each other to reach our goal, planting new churches in the nation? winning new people. And in that room, God is, God loves that. His presence there, He loves it when His people are one, united in mission. So, so that's, I think that's important because it's, it's the framework where the M4 is birthed out of. And we can't take that for granted in a nation like Hungary or maybe other nations. So, but that's the framework. I believe God is Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob's God. He's three generational God. And we need to keep together what belongs together also when it comes to generation. And, and therefore, in the nation, I really work to bring all the generations together <laughs> in church party. Because when the older give space and give authority to the young to really go, wow. What happened? It's a power that is amazing to see when you have this covering from the older generation, from the top leaders, from the denomination leader, from they say, well, we go in this direction. We release you. That's powerful. So I think also this generational thing is extremely important. That's the last word of the Bible, Old Testament, in the end of the day God will bring the hearts of the Father to the sons and the sons to the fathers. If not, he will curse the nation. And I believe this is cr crucial that the generation are brought together. Uh, I often draw that like an arrow. And uh, that's what I tell the people. I say, when, when God pour out his spirit, he pours out of sons and daughters, they are the arrowhead. And then, young men, they are the middle part. 
young son, E M, young man. And then I said, the feather is the the one going to dream, the old, because he's through the spirit of three generations: sons and daughters, young man, and the old. And when God is pouring his spirit out, he brings the generations together. This, look at the Old Testament. They stood as a people, cross generation together. And I believe the young people will be, as the Bible said, the prophetic generation. Because the young will speak prophetic. And the young people will, by definition, be a prophetic generation in the nation. Because that's the only one who can reach their own generation. The father, the old man, will not reach the new culture and new generation. But they are crucially important. But the young sons and daughters will be, by definition, prophetic. So in a nation, it's always important to work across the generation, to release the next generation, to reach their own generation. But they need a covering of the old. If they don't have the young, I have in 10 years, no, I'm crying because that's my heart. This is my heart. I have in 10 years gone around to all the top universal leaders and told one story. And it's the story of Gideon, a young man in just six. That's God spoke to him. And he went up on the, do you know the story? God spoke to him in a difficult situation of the religious history. And God spoke to him, go, I will lead you and will lead you, follow me, God spoke to him. And with fear, he said yes to God. And the first God told him to do, we go up on the mountain, tear down the fathers, the altars of your father. That was not an easy task in that. If you know the context and history and also the culture, it's not an easy task. But it's a question of fearing God more than men. And Gideon went up on the mountain in the night and did it. In the morning, the whole village, some thousand people, men probably, came to his father's doorstep and said, give us your son, we're going to kill him. And what was the response of the father? He said, well, if Baal is really God, he had to fight for himself. I protect my son. And they couldn't do nothing because his father's protection. After that, Gideon went out and won the biggest victory in the whole Israeli history with 300 men. Why? Covering. And I said to these leaders, I said, you can say, kill them. Or you can say, I protect them. It's your choice as a leader. And that's many of all the leaders is in that situation. And many will say to the cold, well, take them. But that's your choice. But as leaders of all the, you are there to cover. You are there to guide, to give wisdom, to cover the young generation. And I think that's, this is this turning around. They understand their role. Because it's, it's understanding the role. They don't need to be young. They need to take the role. And I think when it's happening, it's, it's tremendous power. And this is also happening in Norway. We see how older people understand the role of releasing the young people. They let them go. This is the only one who can reach the old, the, this new generation. And we, you see in UK, there's a lot of young people on fire. When I go in team in Czech, I have with me church planter that in the, is in the 20s. Young people, they are on fire for Jesus. They are regularly leading people to Christ. And when they meet people in Czech and tell their story, the Czech ignites something in their life. Because that story gives something from their own heart, from their own life. So I think M4 is not just a curriculum. It's uh, sharing the life, <laughs> mutual life with each other. 
of what God is doing, of His life within and through us. And this is, but this is my passion. This is where my life is <laughs> bring together what belongs together, and the relation belongs together. But now I'm totally out of what we're talking about. So, okay, um, what are the topic here? Well, we start the master. It's about the master, and it's about he. We have a topic on the kingdom, and I think God's kingdom and His power, and I think. All of you have a king of theology. For us, it's important to say that it's his church, it's his kingdom. It's about him. He's the initiator. So that's the first topic to really understand that he's the one. And then we have a topic of, of the church planter. Because, as you said, we believe that everybody can be a part of a church plant, but not everybody's a church planter. And then we talk about how it's important to for the church to, to, to be accountable, to be um, not on its own. We have seen in, in Norway in the 80s, 17th and 80s, it was planned like 80 to 100 more very independent churches, something called more faith church. I don't know if you know what that is. But it was like a movement of like the right Pentecostal, more even more Pentecostal than the Pentecostal. Uh, and a lot of them was planted in in being better than, we have the new thing. We know. And of these nearly 100 churches, maybe 25 survived. Why? It was planning out of rebellion as the heart of it, many of them. And if you plant things in rebellion, you reap the same with your own people within two to five years. That's because it's a spiritual matter. So we challenge the heart. I will say to a church plant, if you can bless where you're coming from, if you can understand they are standing on the shoulder of, of others, you are not capable to planting a church. If you can bless wholehearted where you're coming from, your heritage, you are really not capable to planting a church. So we accept, we challenge the heart of the people, of the church planter. And we are really working on issue of church plan. We, we talked about there, we talk about, also I say something about theology. It's important you know what you stand on. We have churches that kind of switch within, a church, within the process of church plan. It's not good. You have to have a foundation. I think it's theology foundation. I can, we are training, I training with Ty Dahl and one in Christian fellowship who have written in the book on team. We training together, but in the same training we can say we could never have planted a church together. Never. I'm Lutheran. <laughs> he's more a kind of uh, he's a, in an apostolic network, Pentecostal theology plus some other things. We are very different, but we can stand together. But I would never plant a church with him. Because the theology is different. And it's okay. But I believe he's a part of the kingdom. And he believes I'm as Lutheran is part of the kingdom. You, you understand? So I say, well, it's, it's important that you clarify theology. I don't say, please, all of you, have a Lutheran theology. No, I don't say that. <laughs> but I say, it's important. What you know, have to know what foundation. And when you are planting a Baptist church, well, do you know what foundation you are planting on? If you're planting the free church, well, do you know the foundation? We challenge them on the foundation, the church planter. We also challenge them on what model do you see? If you see three to five years, what do you see? Because we have a market of model, well, X29, that's a model in some way. We can let this get you, okay. <laughs> But we have different models of church, and, and I, I think there's a confusion in that. I think what my experience after 20 years in church, planning, it doesn't matter what model you choose. What does matter, you are consistent in what you choose. That's the key thing. That's the success. But if you are running for the most of the church, I call it impulse driven. 
some inspiration from there, some inspiration from there, and they're going like this, and there's no growth. Because inspiration is not directional, visionary driven. And as a did church planning, what do you see? What model, what, what, will, what will, will, will be visible in three to five years? What is in your mind? And the challenge is that if you have a team from different places, they have different things in their mind. Get it up. If not, you have a challenge one year from now. You are in challenge. Get it out. What are the models? What are in their minds? What do they see? Speak it out. Because it's so easy that there's different model in the mind. And when you start to go, something coming up in the core team. And you are in trouble. Therefore, we talk about building the core team or the start team, a healthy team. It's crucial. How do you build? What are they? And then we have clear vision. What are the visions? So these are the four topics in the beginning. Is, is, is it very special? No, it's not at all. But it's what we think is important as in the beginning. To really focus on. Yeah, it's, it's, it's while well, the teaching of it, it's in the book, all the teaching here. And it was amazing when we did the teaching and we let people do writing the different things. Because I had the two first topic, one from Apostolic Network had the second, third, and the Pentecostal had the fourth. <laughs> You will find thousand Bible quotes in these two books. Because we all believe it is not taking the things from the Bible and understanding from the Bible perspective, it will not hold over the long run. So if you go through here, you have a lot of quotes and Bible quotes all the time to everything. So it's very Bible based. And we hadn't, we didn't say we need to be Bible-based, but all who are involved in this have the same understanding. If there are more apostolic, charismatic something, or Pentecostal or Lutheran. So, so then this is four topics we go through, and we challenge them with question, with some learning goals to really reflect. And as I said, if it's he or me or Eustin Yama, who will be here, Eustin, who's teaching on vision, this will be here on the track and do one of the lessons uh, with the church planning lesson. Church planning track. Uh, doesn't matter. The question do you know where you're going? <laughs> you see what have God spoken to you? He's the master. He's going to build his church. He knows what people have God given you. How committed are you in the team? How do you know each other? We chance that they share the faith history with each other. So they really get in depth to know and understand. And you have some in the team who's quite new Christian, could have, and some who are more mature. I think one of the challenges we hear, we talked about that in the track that it's it's, it's the conversion-based church plan. In the way you start nearly with most of new Christians. That's, that's one of our big challenges. We need to see much more conversion based church planting, where we start out there, where people come into faith, and you start with a team of new, many new people, fairly new people. Okay, my name is Richard. I introduced myself a little bit in the beginning. I am a church planter. I also imported the M4 to Sweden a few years ago. I got to know Ivan, mean, I don't, really don't know when, but maybe 10 years back or so. And uh, we have a, a similar, but not maybe as successful story of church planting in Sweden, but our nations are very similar in many ways. <laughs> Sweden was touched by a pietistic and a Pentecostal revival movement in the 18 hundreds and 1900s. So there, there were church planting movements 
and they peaked in the 19, 1940s in Sweden. But since then, it's been you know going going down. And as you said, the last ten years we've closed about 500 churches in Sweden. At the same time, planted about 50. So 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 that's the situation. So that's why we also have during the last years also gathered our national leaders to to emphasis for church planting and then we found that we needed this tool to, to to help us that are not you know super gifted leaders to train others to to, to do the work you have a question uh, mainly small churches on the countryside that have had a history, but you know, because of people moving out and, and so on, you know, declined and the last person died or something like that. <laughs> no, these churches were were from this uh, from the revivalist movements, most of them. Well, all the denominations, yeah, Pentecostal, Lutheran. Free, free Lutheran, uh, Covenant Churches, uh, Salvation Army, all, all kinds of churches. Uh, let's uh, not deal with that right now. <laughs> so, taking the M4 to Sweden, I think this, this part of, of mission is the, the most important part. So I'm glad you brought the gospel question up on the table. Because reaching people for Christ is the key thing. We can reorganize and reorganize forever, but not really do the work we need to, to, to do. So, so that's uh, you know, one of the, the big things and, and probably the best, best part of, of, of the M4, I think. They have some really good evangelist guys in, in Norway. And they, what you also need to understand that, that most of the evangelical churches and denominations in Norway are deeply influenced by YWAM in Norway. And, 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 and it, it's a good you know, remind, reminder to know because many churches have sent their youth to YWAM, had them trained, going for short-term missions, coming back, and so on. So, so this is a big difference between Norway and Sweden, I would say. Yeah. Uh, we have, I mean, in the border YWAM in Norway, we yeah. have like eight central. 400 full-time workers yeah. and sending so, some missionary routes here to Los Angeles. So, so we have tried to learn some things from, from the, Nor the Norwegians here, <laughs> sharing the gospel. We have a few... Mm. Let's show this picture first. I mean, this is the essence of on the M4, it's the, the Great Commission, the Gospel cha Challenge, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And Acts 1, 8, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Uh, some of the learning goals for, for the mission part is to, to understand uh, church planting as pioneer work and the challenges a church planter might face in his or her daily life. It's about stepping out of your comfort zone. Uh, it's uh, understanding target groups, there are a lot of words here, and it is to, to understand the comfort zone I'm currently living in and that I need to get out of. When, when Jesus entered his ministry, the Spirit led him into the desert. Clearly out of a comfort zone. <laughs> and uh, some other learning goals are to understand uh, the basis of evangelism and understand how the Christian community in itself is evangelical or evangelistic, I think the right word is in English. Uh, how to understand and recognize when the harvest is ripe. There is a Norwegian book, one of the, actually one of the authors of the M4 book has written a book on, on, uh, on, on sharing the gospel. And uh, uh, the title is uh, 
finally Monday, I think, in Norwegian. Thank God it's Monday. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank God it's not. Yeah, so not going to church, but going into the daily life and, and sharing the gospel there. Yeah. Uh, it's about mapping out each team member's social network, seeing where they overlap, starting to see these, see that these people are the people that I impact in my daily life, and I can pray for them, and so on. And also become more knowledgeable in how to share the gospel with others. So some basic training in, in sharing the gospel. To be aware of the power that lies within the gospel's testimony of Jesus, understand the need for the Holy Spirit's power, and be able to design a practical plan for how the team can work together in outreach. So if if an M4 module is, I mean, it is, uh, it's a process, uh, there is content, but, but the content is not the focus, but there is content, and, and, and I think in missions, the, the content is really important, that it, it is about reaching people for Christ, it is about our, it, the, the, yeah, eternal situation and, and all these things and, and also some practical teaching on, on how to uh, how, how to reach out with the gospel and so on. So uh, here is uh, some yeah some, some important content. Uh, well you recognize this but for to, to at least in our, our Swedish context, when we try to define the, the gospel in, in the M4, we, we take our, you know, uh, yeah, we start with this scripture because it's, it's preaching the gospel to the poor, it's to heal the brokenhearted, it's to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed, proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So it's, it's, uh, several dimensions in, in sharing the gospel, which is in, in the Swedish context is also in a person's life uh, a process. And uh, one of my friends developed this, uh, this <laughs> uh, yeah, stairway, like a stairway to heaven, if you want to have music to, to the picture. <laughs> and, how do you move from zero to five? I know you know the angle scale, it's a little different twist on that. But, but people need to go from uh, yeah, from being unaware of the gospel to, to be you know, disciples and, and followers of, of Christ. And uh, In many cases, you know, there's a, a first contact, you meet with someone, you go deeper, conversation, sometime you bring the person to repentance, the people should grow, the person should grow, and uh, you, you want to give them, you know, ongoing training. So it is, you know, in, in the relationship, cooperating with the Spirit and the Word and, and bringing the relationship with Christ into the re relationship with this person that you're trying to reach. So this is another way of looking at it. So first contact can be introducing Christ by meeting needs. It uh, stirs curiosity. And you reveal and proclaim People make decisions. I skip one step uh, here, <coughs> and uh, we because we, we are pretty good at these things in Sweden, and we are pretty good at at you know what happens after repentance, with discipleship and devotion, and giving foretastes of the kingdom and training people in, into service. But it, it is the the repentance thing to, to bring people into reconciliation with, with God. 
through Christ that is the, the, the key thing to, to reach new people. And uh, uh, it's, it's easy to say, it's easy to, to share all these things. I want to show you, uh, I don't want to, let's skip that. On the picture there, you see a lady in a striped t-shirt, and her name is Anna. Uh, she was a very typical Swedish non-believer. She had only gone to a church once for a funeral when she was a kid. She had no interest in religion, she had no interest in Christ. Uh, she was a party girl. and. Uh, she started to work with Maria, who was a member of, of our church. And uh, Maria started to talk to her and get to know her and invited her into a, with some <coughs> other friends from that workplace into a group, a ladies group, talking about what ladies talk about and <laughs> whatever that is. And then uh, the, the relationship Deepen and they started them like an alpha course with the same people and they kept going and uh, What they did was from the start Maria offered to, to pray for her and uh, She said well you can pray for this and you can pray for that and Maria Noted it in a notebook and then she also noted and told Anna when you know and asked them and so they found out God answered these prayers and Anna's testimony is that when, when, when God had answered 30 prayers, 30, 3 prayers, I started to, to think that he may exist. <laughs> and this took probably, you know, 18 months, 2 years, something like that. But then things, you know, when, when she finally got that God is real, things started to speed up. And to make the story short, she... Um, she re received Christ about two years ago. She was baptized, and uh, Maria has trained her. And she's in a, in a home group, and now she's also you know taking steps into leadership in, into our church. But it, it is a long process of, of sharing the gospel, uh, meeting needs, and, and presenting Christ, and so on. Uh, I just want to show you another. This is uh, her husband, Thomas. He's, uh, he was also an unbeliever, but uh, he started to follow Anna's uh, process. And uh, his background was very different. He was a UN soldier in, in Bosnia, very tough guy. Uh, he told me he went to bars to fight just because it was, it was fun to, to beat up people. So he was that kind of <laughs> that kind of guy. And he also, as a teenager, had uh, experiences from spiritism. So he really understood that the spiritual world is real, and he had seen the the dark uh, backsides of, of of that life. And many of his friends from his teens had gone in deeper into occult things and into addictions and a couple of them are are already dead actually so it was you know really a really big thing <laughs> so but but when maria when anna received christ it only took him a few weeks to make you know to, to, to make the decision so he decided to follow christ so i got to baptize him last year and i met him not every week, but at least twice a month for, you know, discipleship conversations. And it's been a process for him to open up his life and share some of these things that I shared with you and uh, praying into it and seeing God releasing him more and more from, from these things from his past. So he's now a very nice guy. <laughs> very peaceful man and uh, their life has, has changed but but his his heart is for some of his relatives and friends from 
from his teen years. So he's uh, trying to find ways to share the gospel with them. So he find, found out that they, he has a sauna at his work. So he invites one of his friends to the sauna <laughs> for an evening. And then when they sit there, they, they sit there and then he can you know, share what God has done in his life. <laughs> And I can't get away, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, na naked and nude, and uh, the yeah, the naked truth. <laughs> yeah. So, so he's a neat guy. But so 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 this is what uh, missions is. The, the missions part is about, and and it's not not. The, I mean, there are several ways you can share the gospel. <laughs> What we try to emphasize that is that you have a story and God has a story. And, and you tell your story to people, what God has done in your life, it's a very good way. But you also need to be able to ex explain what Jesus did so people can respond to that. So we try to, to train people to do that and, and you can, I mean, you know all the, everything for, from the four spiritual laws to the Alpha Course and some other things that I probably probably never heard of, uh, bridge illustrations and, and whatever, but at least, you know, give people something that they can use to, to, to present Christ and share the gospel.